Duck, duck, whoa. Skynet said knock you out. Abracadabra, Alakazam, Open Sesame, Active Directory. These stories and more on today's episode of MSP Dispatch. This episode is presented by the Salty Soul Foundation. Since 2017, Salty Soul has removed over 20,000 pounds of trash in Florida and California. Visit SaltySoulFoundation.org to support this organization via direct donation or purchase of their merchandise. Good morning and welcome to the August 26, 2022 episode of MSP Dispatch, your source for news, community events, and commentary in the MSP channel. I'm Marie Rossini, joined as always by my co-host, Mr. Tony Francisco. How are you doing, Tony? Good, 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 my friend. How the heck are you doing today? I'm fantastic. I still have a job, which is more than I can say for FN Mika. Have you heard of FN Mika? <sighs> I, F, 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 oh, no. <laughs> Go yeah, ahead. I'm, so I'm not one F, of the cool kids. Yeah, I, I'm not either, but FN Mika is a, an AI-driven rapper. Okay, so signed to an AI, uh, the first AI music group, Capital Music Group, went ahead and signed this group, uh, signed FN Mika, who is a virtual robot rapper. Um, and they signed him. Uh, apparently, they're taking using AI to identify parts of popular songs, the, the most popular ones. They're taking the sections that, you know, taking the structure of it and using that to craft new songs. And then they're having it actually, uh, the lyrics created and wrapped by actual artists. Um, unfortunately, FN Mika's uh, brilliant career was cut short um, nearly immediately oh, no. after the story came out. <laughs> they were signed to let go. So a robot can't catch a break, man. I, I don't know what to do about that. Hey, with that, let's get into the news. <laughs> <laughs> Our top story, how MSP marketplaces are changing channel dynamics for solution providers. As reported by Artie Loftus on MSPToday.com, everything as a service, or XAAS, has changed radically over the last several years, impacting how managed service providers procure and deliver services. Scott Chasen, CTO of PAX8, stated, MSPs can successfully deliver on the demands of our increasingly hyper-digital world, despite ongoing supply chain constraints and tight labor markets. In fact, in this uncertain economic time, taking advantage of integrated systems like ours, which blend the marketplace with PSA platforms, is a must-have, not a nice-to-have. According to Grandview Research, by 2025, the size of the global professional service automation market is projected to hit $16 billion. This growth is fueled by the global professional services sector, which is expected to climb from $5.4 trillion in 2021 to $7.1 trillion, about $22,000 per person in the U.S. in 2025. According to Markets and Markets, spending in the cloud-managed service market is expected to reach $139 billion by 2026, up from $86 billion in 2021. The breadth of services is also expanding, according to the same report. Cloud managed services today span mobility, security, data services, and the report indicates with the overall goal of the cloud managed to deliver hassle-free management of businesses, network, security, data center, and mobility services. Tony, you and I sit on CompTIA CDAC, or Channel Development Advisory Council, where the topic of marketplace is brought up as a future mover in the space. It's, we bring that theme up very often. You are especially experienced in marketplaces with your own business, Cloud Plus. Are you seeing these same big money moves as well? So, Ray, I've been talking about this literally since 2007. And at that particular time, when I talked about a singular clicked provision uh, a hosted services distribution platform that would augment remember back then was nothing but hardware, augment the hardware distribution side because the imminent growth in the industry is gonna be from hosted applications, which by the way, back then was just you know a, a, an ASP server at best or somebody hosting it in their garage. Um, but the concept of multi-tenant wasn't really taking on just yet. Now, now keep in mind, you know, I invented the you know, multi-tenant hosted exchange back in 2003. People didn't understand that. Uh, they were so used to purchasing something and, and, and installing it, configuring it. 
but the concept of an instant click to provision, uh, a, a customer facing interface for self administration, uh, the ability to log into your customer's uh, interface to administer it for them as an MSP is so paramount today. Living without it's like living without gravity. You just can't conceptualize it because it's always been here and it's so critical to the everyday life in the IT world. That being said, the next generation, now that everyone's finally a decade later, you know, moving forward um, with that, the next generation of a hosted services distribution offering is going to be something that is so hardwired into the very tools that the MSPs use daily, such as the PSAs and, and the endpoint components. And it's going to continue to expand past that, not just from the customer experience, which is just the purchase, but also the reseller experience and most importantly, the management experience. So I'm really interested to see where this goes, but I think, frankly, uh, they're spot on on this particular article. They understand the vision, they understand the imminent future, the eventuality, and I'm just glad, finally, that we're moving forward. Sorry to eat up all that time, but you know, Ray, give me give me your thoughts on this. I, I mean, I'm sitting here looking at Da Vinci, and you know, of course, I'm going <laughs> to. You know, uh, of, of course, I'm just going to defer to you. When, uh, you know, you have the most experience at this. You know what I mean? I I can say on the customer side or on the MSP side, um, you know, this touches on marketplaces for vendor, supplier, distributor to MSP. Um, a lot of the things we're also focusing on the CDAC, also um, talking about marketplace from the MSP to the client, having, tra uh, having friction-free transactions where the client can only engages with the MSP when they really need to, when it's more meaningful. I've talked about that before. Uh, Marnie Stockman, Lifecycle Insights, noted author, now two books, one with Juan Fernandez, also on our CDAC. Um, you know, they've talked about having only keeping the person-to-person -person conversations when it's meaningful, when you're adding something meaningful to the relationship. If it's just buying a license, let them do it in the easiest way possible whenever they feel like. Um, I am curious, MSPs out there, are you using, I mean, we know there's dashboards, we know there's cloud radial, uh, there's tons of options out there. Um, I used to use Desk Director back in the MSP days, uh, not talking about one or the other, but are you doing any marketplaces for your clients? Are you letting them self-service purchase, provision, procure, implement stuff without any of your intervention. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely curious because now with the advent of RPA services like Roost, specifically in the MSP space, and maybe we'll have uh, Aaron or or we'll have Tim Fournette on uh, to talk about it, but definitely want to hear uh, how you guys are using it. Uh, Tony, but you got some stuff. Yes, something I am so passionate about personally. Uh, this article comes straight from the heart. Microsoft will offer NCE relief in October, says PAX 8's Nick Hetty as he weighs in. Uh, as listed in CRN, the NCE rollout has sparked an outcry from partners frustrated with the new annual software licensing commitments that they claim has put an unfair burden on them and their customers. With NCE, customers are required to make an annual commitment to Microsoft software offerings, like Microsoft 365, or pay a 20% premium on month-to-month -month commitments. Furthermore, MSPs are on the hook for the contractual licensing commitment if a customer reduces their license count in the wake of a layoff or change of business. Hetty said he expects the changes coming from Microsoft to put a large focus squarely back on helping partners grow their business. Microsoft is absolutely listening, Hetty told CRN in an interview after the keynote. Quote, in October, I expect there'll be a lot of great announcements that will ease the fear, ease the tension, and reduce the risk at the partner level as they bring on new customers. Ray, this is my religion. <laughs> Microsoft uh, hosted services distribution platform, which we just got done talking about. I am so deep in the Microsoft world um, and I have not heard anything about this other than this particular article. And I'm usually hearing about things months ahead of time. So I have one question and only one question for you. And this is a heavy one, everyone. Listen to this. What happens if this doesn't happen in October? What happens if there are no changes from Microsoft? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, the only thing I think of is what you talk about, Willis. <laughs> what are you, what are you, we've been hearing about this since last year. How are you going to tell me, yes, it's been delayed over and over, but 
are you really telling me there's a possibility it could not happen? I can't, I can't fathom that at this point. I, and I don't think anyone can, but again, I am deep, deep, deep in the Microsoft world, and I have been since the Genesis. I mean, we were what, our, the third ever SPLA partner, uh, to put that in perspective. Um, and I have not heard anything about this, and all I hear is Nick Hetty weighing in, and he's saying amazing stuff. But the question is, if it doesn't happen from Microsoft, nothing happens in October, are, are, are there, is there accountability? Um, is, is this just you know, sparking hope? There's that quote in the, in the Hunger Games that uh, hope is the only thing stronger than fear. A little hope is effective. A lot of hope can be dangerous. Tony, rebellions start with hope. <laughs> so, you know, the Star Wars thing. All right. Is this dangerous? If it doesn't actually happen, could it backfire? Now, now, granted, I'm not saying that it won't happen. I'm just asking because I personally haven't heard it outside of this particular article. And that being said, it has triggered a ton of hope, but the party isn't over until someone smiles for a mugshot. So I'm just trying to figure out like what, <laughs> when does this end? G give me, give me your thoughts on this. Maybe I'm going too far. Don't get me wrong. I hate NCE. I hate it with a passion. I feel that it is the most anti-partner initiative MS, uh, Microsoft has ever done. And they've done some stuff. But at this point, I mean, the word that flashes in my head is torturous. I, the, the amount of things that MSPs have had to go through, plan, the amount of times that we've like planned on a date and we've communicated with our customers or waited to the date. Um, this to me seems to erode confidence. It's one thing to say, and don't get me wrong, I would love it if an NCE doesn't I never existed. I, I, I don't want the hate mail coming in, news at mspmedia.tv. I don't want the hate mail coming in saying, but you wanted NCE to happen. No, I do not. I hate NCE. But at the same time, could you imagine the conversations that have been had with your clients? Hey, you're locked in for a year at a time. If you reduce seats, you're stuck paying it no matter what. And prices are going up 20%, 35%, 255%, whatever. And then the number of times the dates got delayed and then to go back and say, just kidding. It's, it's one thing for us to have eroded confidence in Microsoft and it'd be awesome to, for it to not happen. But at the same time, you're making us look foolish to our clients. Totally agree. What, what, what about, we haven't even talked about what happens if a customer, one of your, as an MSP, what happens if one of your customers go to, goes out of business, who's stuck with that bill? You, the yeah, MSP. Right now. Yeah. And, and, and I'd also like to point out that MSPs are freaking out, but guess what? You're not actually stuck with the bill. The CSP is stuck with the bill, which means it goes upstream, and that's going to be a PAX, a DNH, Tech Data, Inger, Micro, whoever it may be uh, for, those, uh, for those. Or if you have your own direct CSP, you're absolutely 100% on, on the hook for that. So this is a huge inspirational topic. But again, what if it doesn't happen? And I'm really, really curious if we can follow up in October to see if it does happen. Because if it does, then I have to reevaluate my friends in the network and uh, in my place in this. But uh, if it doesn't happen, then we really have to figure out if you know that hope was intentional to inspire action. I really hope it wasn't used as a marketing ploy. I really hope that they know something that you know, a lot of us don't. Um, I'm really interested to hear where it goes. But I'd like to tell everyone, hang on. It gets worse. Ray, what do you have on the table right now? In our third top story, Microsoft warns that SolarWinds hackers gain powerful magic web authentication bypass. As reported by Liam Tung on ZDNet, Microsoft has warned that the hacking group Nobellum, which was behind the 2020 SolarWinds supply chain attack, have a new technique for bypassing authentication in corporate networks. Nobellum actors have pulled off several high-profile supply chain attacks since compromising SolarWinds in late 2020. That attack compromised 18,000 targets, including several U.S. agencies and tech firms, including Microsoft. Since then... Microsoft and other security firms have identified multiple sophisticated tools, such as backdoors used by Novellum, and MagicWeb is the latest. 
Magic Web targets enterprise identity systems, namely Active Directory Federation Server, or ADFS. ADFS provides secure identity federation and web single sign-on services. Federation with Azure AD or Office 365 enables users to authenticate on-premise services with cloud services using the same credentials and allows them to access those resources in the cloud. As a result, Microsoft recommends isolating ADFS and restricting access to it. Microsoft emphasized that Nobellum remains highly active. Last July, Microsoft revealed that it found InfoStealer malware from Nobellum on the PC of one of its support agents, which was then used to launch attacks on others. Nobellum actors have also impersonated USAID in spear phishing campaigns. In October, Microsoft spotlighted Nobellum attacks on software and cloud service resellers, once again abusing the trust between supplier and customers to exploit direct access to customers' IT systems. A month prior to the cloud reseller attacks, it exposed a Nobellum tool called FoggyWeb, a post-compromised backdoor that collected details from an ADFS to gain token signing and token encryption certificates and to deploy malware. Tony, this seems all too familiar for Nobellum. They're not attacking the final resources, they're attacking the, the upstream services to enable access to everything they want to get eventually. Uh, what's your take on this? All I hear is ADFS, you know, Active Directory Federated Services, um, you know, isolating that. Um, ADFS, if you're federating, you, <laughs> if you're federating, you are opening up your brain, get the neurons to the outside world. And if you don't have that locked down in a way that is so incredibly siloed to what you're trying to achieve, um, you are just open to a, a list of horrible, horrible events in the future. And, and I would challenge that um, the things that they've uncovered right now from a federation attack, uh, if they're attacking or using uh, ADFS as the entry point, um, I would challenge that that is the tip of the iceberg. I think there's going to be a lot of it. Because remember, you can use uh, federation to authenticate into anything <laughs> anywhere that it's right, connected. That's the point, right? That's the idea. It's literally the point. It's making it easy. So I'm just trying to figure out, are they saying that, hey, we found a problem here? Or are they saying, everybody, you better lock down your, keep your ADFS, get get away from that. Or, and I'm just throwing out, I'm, I'm speculating across the board. Are they saying, hey, switch to Azure because you don't have to worry about that stuff. But you still have federation problems that can occur, but maybe they have it locked down with, you know, uh, prepackaged out of the box uh, policies. Right. Um, I, I, I have so, from a technical perspective, um, all the techies right now, this is 100% porn. Everybody's like, yes, 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 yes. Um, uh, the pedestrians out there are saying, that, what is going on? It, it's not good. <laughs> None of this is good. I mean, at, at one, on one hand, you know, this to me seems obvious they're they're not breaking in the door they're not going in breaking a window in the back of the yard and trying to get in the house that way they're copying the key right this is no different than if you gave keys to somebody else adfs is good it's something that's been around forever it's not like a brand new thing um which is and it has fantastic uses right in the cloud we have our saml stuff we have our single sign single sign on is good central authentication is good but as we work to make it easier and easier to implement, you have to worry about security. And, and normally you see these articles that say, this is how you do it. Step one, do this. Step two, do this. Nowhere does it say, lock your shit down. Yes, I know Phil has to beep that. <laughs> but no, like that article's like that, those five steps aren't there. And this is something I, I used to rage against security researchers before. Stop telling me about all the horrible things that could happen. Give me the exact steps I need to do to prevent things or to secure myself. Well, these how-to articles, need to start talking about how to secure it in the same article because that's not a separate step it's part of the steps for setting it up realistically the people i expect to get breached by this stuff are the same people leaving you know rdp 3389 or 3390 secure um, you know open to the web uh you know the people that leave you know firewall uh auth interfaces or admin interfaces open to the web the ones that aren't worried about security they're just worried about making it work which is I'm, why I'm such a proponent of cloud native services. Let the brilliant people figure out how to make it work. You just use it and you figure out how to make use of it. Uh, but, you know, all you security nerds listening to all this porn that we've been talking about with, you know, for the last uh, couple minutes, let us know in the comments. Let us know what's uh, what you're doing about it. Does it matter to you? 
Tell us how you've been securing your own ADFS so we can teach others. Love to hear from you. News at mspmedia.tv. Hit us in the comments. Hit us on Reddit. Hit on social. Uh, we want to hear from you. In our first notable mention, this company paid a ransom demand and hackers leaked the data anyway. Shown in ZDNet.com, written by Danny Palmer, written the real-life incident as detailed by cybersecurity researchers at Barracuda Networks, took place August 2021 when hackers from Black Matter Ransomware Group used a phishing email to compromise the account of a single victim at an undisclosed company. Despite this, the unidentified organization chose to pay the ransomware after negotiating payment down from half the original demand. But even after the company gave in to the extortion demands, the Black Matter Group still leaked the data for a few, a few weeks later, providing a lesson you should never trust cyber criminals. Cybersecurity responders from Barracuda helped the victim isolate the infected systems, bring them back online, and restore them from backups. And in our next notable mention, this one hits a little close to home to me personally, shown on bleepingcomputer.com, Plex warns users to reset their password after a data breach. Written by Bill Tolas, apologize for the pronunciation, the Plex media streaming platform is sending password reset notices to many of its users in response to discovering unauthorized access to one of its databases. According to the letter that a reader shared with Bleeping Computer, the intruder potentially accessed a limited subset of data, including email addresses, usernames, and encrypted passwords. Plex reassured customers that no credit card information is stored on their servers. At this time, the impact of the incident and password reset action is unclear. It's recommended that you follow Plex's instructions on resetting your password immediately to minimize the chance of your account being taken over. In my first notable, anyone can sign up for DuckDuckGo's privacy protecting at duck.com email address, as reported by Emily Roth on TheVerge.com. After a year in private beta, DuckDuckGo has finally announced that its email protection service is finally available to all users. Its email protection service lets you use a personal or private Duck address to shield your real email address from companies and strip off trackers in your email that reveal your location and device when opened. The service has a new features that remove any trackers embedded in the links, added to emails, and convert any links using an unencrypted HTTP connection to a secure HTTPS link. However, because the email is sent from your email client, like Gmail, the company says it cannot guarantee email will not include your forwarding address or any other personal identifier. Also released with this is a Chrome Edge Firefox Opera plugin that allows you to also create private non-traceable email addresses for one-time use with certain vendors. And just for funsies, since you know we love ducks, whether they're rubber duckies or those from Hack5, uh, you can email us at mspmedia at duck.com so we can check out how it works. Shoot us an email and we'll be sure to feature it on this show. And my second notable mention, Google uncovers a tool used by Iranian hackers to steal data from email accounts. I guess they weren't protected by DuckDuckGo. <laughs> As reported by Ravi Lakshamanan on thehackernews.com, the Iranian government-backed actor Charming Kitten has added a new tool to its arsenal of malware that allows it to retrieve user data from Gmail, Yahoo, and Microsoft Outlook accounts. First discovered in 2021 and dubbed Hyperscape by Google Threat Analysis Group, TAG, actively in development software has been used against at least 24 accounts in Iran since 2020. Hyperscape requires the victim's account to run a valid authenticated user session that has already been hijacked and designed to run on the attacker's Windows machine. The tool is then able to download and exfiltrate contents of a victim's email inbox and delete security emails sent by Google. According to Google Tag researcher Alex Bash, Hyperscape is not notable for its technical sophistication, but rather for its effectiveness in accomplishing the actor's objectives. Affected accounts have since been resecured and victims notified. And in our community feedback, we've got Josh Hobain saying, great weekly update. We love the feedback, positive and some negative. We love the feedback. Thank you so much, Josh. In our upcoming community events, 
August 30th at 10 a.m. Eastern, MSP Dispatch presented by the MSP Media Network, Mr. Tony Francisco and yours truly. 8.30 at 2 p.m. Eastern, What Have You Done For Me Lately? Communicating the value of cybersecurity in your QBRs presented by Huntress and Lifecycle Insights. August 30th and September 1st, virtual event Battle Royale, Pitch It presented by the Channel Program. September 1st at 6.30 p.m. Eastern, the Tech Bar Podcast, episode 42, with Reed Wellick, Wes Spencer, and Luke Walker. September 2nd at 10 a.m. Eastern, MSP Dispatch Week Wrap-Up, presented by the MSP Media Network, with Tony Francisco and Ray Orsini. And then to wrap it up, September 2nd at 5 p.m. Eastern, 38 at 38, episode 4, featuring Mario Gallego. Don't forget to check out our other shows on the MSP Media Network, such as 38 and 38, hosted by Aaron Bolton. Hi, I'm Aaron, and I'm a Jabaholic. We all have something in common. We all have a worst job story. Each episode, I'll welcome one guest to share their most insane worst job story. And in return, I'll share one of mine. Join me the first Friday of every month for new episodes of 38 at 38. What an awesome show from Aaron Bolton. I, I just can't imagine being on that show. Hashtag foretelling. Ooh. So if you want to see Tony on, shoot us, follow us on social <laughs> at MSPmedia.tv or email news at MSPmedia.tv. Tony. Did you know we have a phone number now so they can leave voicemail messages? For Get us to out of here. Show? Yes, sir. We'll put it on screen and we'll put in the notes. 833-MSP-NETWORK. The only phone number for MSPs. Uh, yeah, we'll go with that. So how'd you like today's show? If you liked it, hit that thumbs up button. If you didn't, hit it twice. I'm good with it. If you want to hear more, go ahead and hit that subscribe button on YouTube or your favorite podcatcher. As my friend Rich Banky says, make sure to tell a friend. Also, tag us on social at MSP Media TV and give us that hashtag foretelling. Have any questions? Email news at MSPmedia.tv for answers on the next episode. All right, Tony, I think that's all she wrote for uh, today's dis uh, today's MSP Dispatch. We got ducks. We got angry kittens. We have uh, rappers that were hired and fired within 48 hours. They're not even real rappers. <laughs> <laughs> You, see, you're not, you and I are from the Biggie days, the Tupac Yes, days, NWA, like, yes. If, if you don't know Sugar Hill Gang, if you don't know Rapper's Delight, like beginning to end, all 14 minutes, not the four-minute version, I, what are you doing? I want to see if I can get a, a Sugar Hill Gang Rapper's Delight, but an AI give me something of that quality. Oh, my gosh. I'm in. Uh, but until next time, take care of you guys. Take care of yourselves and each other. See you all. This has been a broadcast of the MSP Media Network. Tony, you and I sit in Contia CDAC or the channel develop develop. Blah, 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 blah. I made it all the way through the damn story and I, I suck at my own words. Okay. Oh. I, I, I've been talking about this uh, You're muted. literally since. Awesome. <laughs> How? No. Am I? No. Uh, what I'm saying is, yes, I uh, I bring the sexiness to the market. Ah! You, you can hear me. I can't, I can't hear me. <laughs> ah! <laughs> ah, this what happened? It's not me. It's you. <laughs> uh, oh, there we go. Okay. My earbuds That's might have funny. died. That was funny. Tony. But you got some stuff talking about, uh, I, I don't even know what the story is. I forgot. Uh, <laughs> sorry, dude. I know we talked about it at length before we, uh, what you call it. Um, and we have some community feedback from Josh Hobine. Hobine? Hobine? Hobbit? 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 Uh, you guys, come on. Help me with this one.
uh, Hobian. That's where I was going. Hobian. Hobie. 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 But it's, I'm guessing. But, but, Hobian. 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 Hobain. <laughs> I like Hobain. I like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like Kurt, Kurt Hobain. Hobain. Yes. Yeah. Josh Hobain. Hobain. I don't know. I just Hobain. go for something to apologize. Yeah. I, like so. like, uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey. Uh, okay. So I'm gonna. 